Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1%. A real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast, part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Brian Keating. He's a Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Physics at the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences, uh, abbreviated as CAS. Uh, This is the part of the Department of Physics at University of California, San Diego. And I want to talk to him about two books he's written. One is uh, Losing the Nobel Prize, and the second one we'll reveal once we're done discussing this. But both you know, have different aspects of Brian's life and of his thought process. So I think both would be good to go through. So, Brian, thanks for coming. Ah, oh, It's a great pleasure, Richard. Thank you so much for allowing me to besmirch the name of geniuses everywhere. Uh, well, tell me a bit about your, your history. Like, How did you get into physics, and what are some of the big moments in your career you feel like? Well, I was always uh, kind of a curious kid, and um, one night I was dr- uh, awoken in the middle of the night by a bright light shining into my room. I thought it was a, I thought it was a street light, uh, but there were no street lights on at the time. Then there was uh, a thought that maybe it was uh, my brother turning on the lights in my bedroom, and none of these explanations panned out. And I looked outside the window, and it was the moon, and I'd never seen it so bright. And there was a little, you know, plane next to it, or super bright, you know, UFO or something next to it. And I I had no idea what that was. It was like a star, but it was like really incredibly brilliant. I'd never seen anything like it. So I went back to bed and this is 1984. So you couldn't really, you know, I didn't want to wait for Google to be invented, you know, like 15 years later. So I had to wait for the New York Times to come out on Sundays. And it used to have this section called Cosmos. I was living in Westchester County, New York. And I looked at, and it showed you what the sky would look like, you know, at night that night. And it showed the moon, and then it showed the planet Jupiter was right next to the moon. So right at that moment, I realized I I just, well, in hindsight, I realized I had just done scientific research. I just like kind of had an idea, confused, puzzled, no idea what's going on, and then waited and found some primary research, you know, material to investigate what that was. I was 12 years old. Then I was just like really hooked, and I wanted to learn more and more. And I felt like, well, imagine if I had a telescope, but, you know, I was like, telescopes, they must cost like millions of dollars, you know, like I thought it would be, uh, you know, like you need a a space station or something. Uh, But it turned out I could buy one for about $50. And, and in so doing, I could do really kind of astronomical research. And I, and I got a telescope. I had a job. I was working a little bit, but my mom also supplemented my funding and, uh, and I bought a telescope and then my life, you know, changed even more than, the realization that I had seen another planet with my naked eye, because when I looked at that same planet, Jupiter, I saw it had moons going around it. And this is like a $50 telescope. It's not like some massive million dollar instrument. And I was just like, yeah. And I I have a video on my YouTube channel. That's, uh, you know, called the, uh, the gift that made me a scientist for this uh, holiday season or whenever people are listening to this, uh, there's YouTube video where I talk about how and why the site, the telescope is the most 
uh, the most important gift you could ever get a young kid if you want him or her to turn into a scientist because only with a telescope, not with a large hadron collider or, you know, an atom smasher or rocket ship. Yeah, those are out of stock at the store lately. Exactly. Yeah, the issues. shipping, yeah, the shipping crisis that we're having. But instead you can actually feel the feelings that scientists had when they made a discovery for the first time. In other words, you don't have a large hadron collider, even if you did, which cost 10 billion euros, you can't feel the feeling of what it felt when they discovered the Higgs boson because it took place over years and there were 6,000 people that felt it, quote unquote. And it's really just like a blip on a chart. Whereas when you look at Jupiter and you see its moons, you not only see what Galileo saw, you will feel what Galileo felt when he became the first human being ever to use a telescope to look at the stars. And well, one, thought, one question here, what did yeah. you feel when you saw this stuff? And if you've repeated the experience, let's say with your kids or recently, what did you feel now? Yeah. So watching a kid on have this reaction, again, allows a parent to relive it, but it also viscerally connects you to these great scientists of human history because the exact same size instrument, the exact same power in the instrument, except nowadays it has a you know, smartphone adapter, you know, GPS and stuff. Even I couldn't imagine, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, but, but even, you know, more remote from what Galileo could have envisioned. But when you look at it, um, even now, you know, Richard, when I look through a telescope with my kids or even by myself, you're overcome with awe because your brain is intimately connected to your eyeballs. Your eyeballs are little telescopes. They have lenses, they have detectors, and it's very quickly and short path between your eyes and your brain. And by doing that and actually having a notebook and just sketching the craters on the moon, the shadows, the mountains, you reproduce. It's impossible for anybody, you know, who's cognitively aware to look at the mountains on the moon and not realize the moon has mountains. In other words, you see these shadows, you see these jagged peaks, you see dark plains, you see lava tubes and stuff like that. Um, and so you immediately do what? You formulate a hypothesis. What I am seeing is very similar to what appears on Earth. Earth has mountains. It has like river valleys. It has all these things. And so now you're doing science because now you're using the scientific method. You have a hypothesis. You have observations or data. You refine your hypothesis. Well, there's no water on the moon. I can't see that. So what kind of river could make these kind of weird patterns? Why does it have so many of these circular things on it? Uh, why do some of those circular things have mountains inside of the circle? Uh, and then you start making hypotheses. So you become a scientist instantaneously. Now, you may not go on to, you know, win the Nobel Prize or lose it in the case uh, of myself, but you may develop a newfound respect for the power and the, the, the artistic beauty of science, which is something most people don't think about. They think about scientists, special people doing special things and special rooms and special equipment. <laughs> you know, they don't think about we're just human beings. And that's what really links us all together. This passion for understanding and appreciating the beauty of the universe that surrounds us. One interesting thing that my ear caught is that you, you call it the beauty of science, but do people call it the beauty of nature? And do you think of it that way? Or you call it science instead when you observe the universe, let's say, you know, the moon, moons around Saturn, et cetera. Another, you know, video and thing I, I like to talk a lot about is the difference between knowledge and wisdom. So the word uh, science in ancient Latin, as I know you understand fluently, uh, the word science, it means knowledge. And there's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. You know, as the old joke goes, you know, uh, knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. And I think in the case of knowledge today, we, we have instantaneous access to knowledge. Another way to say it is information. Wikipedia is smarter than every Nobel Prize winner ever lived. Uh, and yet it has no wisdom. It has pure knowledge. So what is more valuable in an age where everybody has information, access, people are listening to this, they have access to the internet. They have access to all the human knowledge ever acquired. But what becomes much more rare in such a situation is wisdom. And I think wisdom in with regard to science is this difference between facts and appreciation. When you understand and make connections, the first step in the scientific method is not just is, is to observe something. And then the second step is now to use your brain, which requires wisdom to create a hypothesis. Why is the moon? Why does, uh, Saturn, why is it surrounded by these weird rings? Like, what is that caused by? Or maybe they're like, uh, another planet as Galileo thought they were, or maybe they're like uh, a smushed out moon that got spread out and pulverized, literally turned into dust, dust. Dust, dust. 
so yeah, so having this this ability to reflect, to ruminate, to contemplate, and having space in your mind, in your life to do this is what makes someone uh, a scientist. And then appreciating what science can reveal and what it cannot reveal is what I think provides wisdom. And I think the appreciation of nature is only bound to increase the more you know about something. If 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 you have you know kids or something like the day they're born is amazing. They're beautiful, amazing. They're beautiful, amazing thing. In fact, all they do is take, you know, they take a dump on your diaper in your cow, you know, whatever they do only, they cost money. They take, and they don't give you anything except they give you this fulfillment at what their potential is likely to become. And every day you get to know them more and more, you fall more and more in love with them. And, and it only deepens such that the first day you met them was magical. It was a spark of, of incredible connection. But obviously, the more you invest, the deeper your wisdom comes about them and what their nature is, the more you love them. And the same is true of science. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. No, this is really cool. I like what you're saying. So what was the losing the Nobel Prize book about? Like what inspired you to write it? What's the main theme and thoughts of it? So I had been uh, confused about what I would do for a career. I loved astronomy. I had this telescope since I was age 13. And yet I thought no one's going to pay me to use this telescope or to learn about astronomy. Like what kind of person could get employed to do that? And in truth, there are more professional NBA basketball players than professional uh, professors of astronomy like myself. And so it wasn't a, a really a, that incorrect an assumption that I couldn't do this uh, as a career, even though later I would turn out to do it. So I felt it was like, oh, like, who's going to pay me to be, you know, an ice cream tester? Like, that's not going to happen. Uh, and yet... I realized that there's kind of this, this very, very few people want to become astronomers and really want to become professional scientists, technicians, engineers, mathematicians, et cetera. And so if you are interested in it and if you develop a taste for research, in other words, just sketching out, thinking, having a notebook, these things don't cost a lot of money. And when I went to college, I was like, this is still kind of out of reach, but I'm going to keep doing it until I reach some obstacle that prevents me from going any further. And I just never hit that obstacle. I did okay in grades. I went to a good graduate school. I got a PhD. And even then, it wasn't until my almost my late 20s, early 30s when I had an idea that I really want to study the biggest topics in the universe. I want to understand how did the universe itself come into existence? And there are many proposals of how the universe could be. It could be the universe is infinite. It could be the universe is, is, is finite. It could be the universe is oscillating into and out of existence, a big bang and then a big crunch. It could be all these different things that take place and that we don't know about uh, because we don't have technology available to test the different hypotheses and really to prove competing ones wrong. And so I realized in the early 2000s that it was possible for the first time in history to really go back and see if there was a single origin of our universe. And, and that theory is known as the Big Bang Theory. And yet it's not understood whether there was only one Big Bang or maybe there have been multiple Big Bangs throughout all of eternity. And, you know, as, as they say, eternity is a pretty long time, especially towards the end. And we don't really know if there is an end or a beginning. So I was fascinated by that. And I decided, along with colleagues at Caltech and UC San Diego and Harvard and elsewhere, to build a telescope that we later took to the South Pole in Antarctica. And that telescope would take us back to the beginning of time, if time had a beginning. And even the eminent scientist Stephen Hawking had said that was a foolish pursuit. There is no beginning. There is no time before the beginning of time. The Big Bang was everything. And so we decided not to take his word on authority. Uh, and you should never do that in science. You should never say someone's like a god, and we're just going to listen to what he or she says. And uh, we want to test and prove everyone uh, right or prove everybody wrong. And so we built this telescope called BICEP, and we took it to the South Pole. 
And people told us if we're successful, if we measure the beginning of time, had a big bang in this particular fashion called inflation, we will win a Nobel Prize. And the Nobel Prize is the most significant award, I claim, not only in science, but on the whole planet. Go ahead. Good question. What, what does that mean, beginning of time? Like you just, you saw back, what, another extra quarter billion years than other telescopes? Or what does that mean? How would you know you're at the beginning of time? If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yeah, so so all telescopes are time machines because light travels at a finite speed. It's the fastest speed, but still nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So when if the universe had a single origin, they would produce heat, light, and, and matter because we know we see the universe has heat and light and matter. And it also has things like dark matter and antimatter and things we can get into some other time. But we knew that that origin would produce the very first possible signals that could ever be detected. And it has to do with a very technical branch of physics called general relativity, something Einstein came up with 100 years ago. And it has to do with the fabric of our universe is called space-time. And if the universe came into existence in a single moment at a singular Big Bang, there would be essentially an infinite amount of energy in a finite volume of space, and that would shake up space and time even to this day. And we could measure the aftershocks, kind of the explosive power, the uh, the echoes of creation would be detectable, obviously using a very specialized instrument, this telescope that sees heat, not light. So it was looking for the heat of this explosion if the explosion took place. And if we measured it, we were told by Nobel Prize winners themselves that we would win a Nobel Prize. And so this was the biggest thing I could possibly study. This is to a scientist winning the Nobel Prize is like the Super Bowl plus the World Series plus, you know, the Latin Grammys, you know, anything you could throw in there. It's, it's everything to a scientist because science is not really, you know, appreciated as far as scientists are concerned. We don't really get the love that we feel like we deserve. I mean, we're talking on a piece of technology now, which is not only computer, which is billions of transistors, but we're talking over the internet, over Wi-Fi, et cetera, et cetera. All those things that I just mentioned were invented by physicists. And yet we don't get the love. We don't get the money. We don't you know, charge a penny per email. All of that was invented by, by physicists, not, not even just scientists. Wi-Fi, cell phones, the internet. This is an incredible trove of technological goodies that we've provided. And yet we're the worst kind of uh, monetizers of the technology we create. So how do we monetize what we've done or how do we, how do we get the attention that we, we feel we deserve? Well, it turns out we have something called the Nobel Prize in the field of physics. And in that way, we get remunerated in the, to a small degree, not monetarily. Very, I mean, you win a million dollars if you win the Nobel Prize, nothing to sneeze at. Uh, but you know, if you think about it, there's 500 companies in the S&P 500 or the Fortune 500. You know, there's only one Nobel Prize. So it's kind of a monopoly on a par with no other monopoly. There's nothing that compares to it in the mind of a scientist, in the desires of a scientist, and almost so much so that it becomes almost like a religion, or at least it did for me. It became almost like an idol that I worship, that I want to win so badly because I wanted the attention for doing something so monumental that I would go down in history along with peers such as Richard Feynman, Albert Einstein, Marie Curie, et cetera. And that to me was intoxicating. So you said you got this telescope to the South Pole and, you know, you did some observations, I would suppose. And what, what did you see that was interesting and new? So there was a prediction that we would see a particular type of this heat left over from the Big Bang called the cosmic microwave background radiation. This heat, it's not like nuclear radiation, it's just light and heat, is in the form of microwaves. And it travels through all of the universe since the light was created 14 billion years ago almost. And we saw a particular pattern which was indicative of a very violent birth of the universe, or so we thought. And so it exactly matched the predictions that not only claimed the universe would have this early explosive singular origin and not multiple origins or not multiple you know, parallel universes at the time, but that the universe essentially began in what's called a singularity of infinite temperature and density. But not only do we see that, but it was a signal that would surely usher in Nobel Prizes for at least some of us. And so we saw that signal and we actually had a press conference at Harvard University. And by this time, I should point out that even though I created the experiment, which is called BICEP, its successor was the one that made this measurement. It's kind of like when you upgrade iPhone you know, 11 to iPhone 13, it gives it more power, more you know, processing, more pixels in the camera, et cetera, et cetera. So I had been actually kicked out of the leadership of the project that I had helped to create. 
And so I wasn't at this press conference where these results were announced at Harvard in 2014. And that made the front page of the New York Times, uh, the opening of CNN, you know, uh, headline news that night, et cetera, et cetera. It literally made headlines around the world and TV and radio. And, uh, and yet I wasn't a part of it. And furthermore, the claims that we made were so fantastic. Uh, that they not only impacted physics and this branch of cosmology, the origin evolution of the universe that I study, but they impinged upon philosophy and some said on theology. So we actually had people that very day saying that our results from bicep two prove that there's no God. And then there were other people saying that it proved that there was a, so it was very interesting. So it had a greater impact than I think almost any other type of observation could have. I mean, you sequence the DNA of a virus that's amazing. It's incredible, but it doesn't really necessarily have religious overtones or connotations. I mean, we can talk about it. What did you guys discover that what there? We discovered the heat that was predicted. We discovered that there was a singular origin to the universe. So we discovered that there was a big, a single big bang and we discovered how the big bang banged. What put the bang in the big bang? <laughs> that it didn't need, according to some, a God to, to create that explosion, that it was created from something called a quantum field. And that quantum field has a name called in, the inflaton. And the inflaton has a shrapnel, a signature that it leaves from the explosion during this origin event 13.82 billion years ago. And that shrapnel is what we detected. The shrapnel is in the form of heat. So we measured the heat that told us there was a single big bang, which to some people said there was a quantum origin of the universe. And some said that it was a, a theological or the, theistic origin of the universe. So that's what we saw. We saw, and it's very, ta- I mean, to explain, I do in the book, Losing the Nobel Prize, describe the physics behind it, the pattern that we saw, and the actual signature that has ca- kind of like the shrapnel of a, a an almost incomprehensible explosion. And, and that's what we saw. So it was, it was phenomenal, literally a phenomenon. What's the estimated power of the explosion? Like, you know, what, what units could you put it in where it's understandable? Well, uh, the biggest particle accelerator on earth is called the Large Hadron Collider. It accelerates particles called protons to almost the speed of light. It's, it's impossible to actually accelerate things to the speed of light that have any mass. Uh, but these particles, which are the heaviest of the particles that make up atoms, they accelerate to nearly the speed of light and then they crash together 10 trillion times, you know, per hour, these protons traveling in a ring, uh, that has a diameter of 27 kilometers. It has a circumference rather of 27 kilometers. So imagine a, a tube, like a racetrack, 27 kilometers around. It's unbelievable. So, you know, it's 15, 16 miles around and then they're accelerating at the speed of light. They crash together. And then they, they slam into one another trillions of times per second. And these measurements are the biggest explosions we can make on Earth. And this explosion is uh, 10,000 trillion times smaller than what we think happened during the Big Bang. To reproduce the conditions of the Big Bang, you would need not a 27 kilometer circumference particle accelerator. You would need something larger than our entire galaxy. So there's no That's way to, to know because yeah. we probably don't want to recreate those conditions. It might be a problem. <laughs> that's right. Could ruin your day. That's, you know, again, I don't think that's particularly, you know, plausible, but here's another way to think about it. The sun is a giant, enormous nuclear furnace that's undergoing nuclear fusion. It's taking two hydrogen nuclei called protons and fusing them together and making helium. And, uh, and that's happening, you know, the equivalent of something like 50,000 um, Hiroshima slash Nagasaki bombs worth, even though those are fission bombs, this is fusion. But anyway, that much energy per second. Now, in our own galaxy, Richard, there's a 100 billion stars, more or less like our sun. And in our universe, there's approximately a 100 billion galaxies, just like the Milky Way galaxy. So imagine the number 100 billion squared. And then imagine <laughs> that's how many stars are, are producing nuclear fusion at this moment. And all of that energy is less than a percent of how much energy there was taking place during the Big Bang in one second. So is there about a mole of stars? You know, yeah. You know, uh, very good. Yeah, about a mole. Of course, yeah. as we say in San Diego, if you want a mole, it's a guacamole. Are we able to observe any collisions or like black holes merging or, you know, think stars going supernova to get a lot further than we could ever get on Earth, but still get some insight into, you know, some of the facets and aspects of the Big Bang? Yeah, so this is the primary 
method to go back in time using this type of astronomical telescope. There could be one other type of, of observation. Again, it's all predicated on measuring how violent are the shakings of space and time during an enormously small fraction of a second. And really, again, to do it in any other way would either really kind of require you to teleport, you know, and time travel back to the beginning of time so that you could be closer to the explosion itself. Because we're, again, the explosion is cooling off and expanding at, you know, 13 billion, 800 million years ago. It's been expanding that whole time. So no, there is no other way to go after it. And we had to build this technology, not necessarily the technology could be built in space. It's just much more expensive to do it in space than even going to the South Pole, which is just like another planet. As far as I'm concerned, it's like a pure ice planet, flat in all directions, 9,000 feet above sea level on solid block of ice. You know, high temperatures can be negative 40 degrees uh, in the summertime there. And then in the winter, it goes below 100 degrees. I've never been there in the winter. I've been there twice in the summertime, which, you know, kind of starts in December and goes through March. And then, but we do pay people to spend a whole year of their life down there. And those people get paid about $75,000. And they only experience one day and night because the sun only comes up once in the beginning of uh, September and the end of September. And then it sets again in March and they don't see it again until beginning of September. So it's a very foreign, hostile right. place, and it's an amazing, beautiful place to go to. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. I didn't realize it was so high above sea level. I guess the Arctic is at sea level, and Antarctica is uh, way above sea level. Yeah, that's a good point. So Antarctica is a continent, but there is no continent at the North Pole. So the Arctic, you know, I mean, Canada, et cetera, so there is no North Pole. If you go to the North Pole, it's a block of ice, hopefully, in the winter, and you drill down through the ice, you get to ocean. You get to the North Pole or ocean. And if you go to the South Pole, you dig through 9,000 feet of ice, you hit rocks. And so, yeah, it's a continent, unlike, uh, and it's good that it's high, because as you go up high, the atmosphere cools off. And even though it's super cold on the ground there, it gets even colder or higher up you are. And what we're looking for are microwaves. So if you've ever microwaved something in a, in a microwave oven, the microwave works by agitating molecules of water. So microwaves get absorbed by water, and they cause it to agitate, rotate, vibrate, et cetera. And so you don't want these photons, these particles of light that have been born 13.82 billion years ago, hopefully carrying Nobel Prizes along with them. You don't want them to get absorbed in a water molecule above your atmosphere. So the best place to do this is in space where there is no humidity, uh, but the South Pole is pretty damn close. What telescopes now do you think have a hope of uh, advancing what you guys figured out? with uh, BICEP. I heard there's like the James Webb telescope. Yeah. Yeah. The James Webb telescope is going to be launched soon. That telescope is more like a successor to Hubble, uh, except that it can look much farther back with much higher resolution and time. James Webb was, uh, yeah, it's one of the first telescopes to not be named after an, a scientist. So he was, uh, he was kind of like the head cheese at NASA in the 1950s or 60s when they had their you know, kind of golden age to get to the moon and, and get people in space. But what I didn't mention is that our results that we claimed would lead to a Nobel Prize, obviously, and would take us back. Those were, we had to retract those. We are actually not currently able to say whether or not there was a Big Bang. Our results had a fundamental mistake associated with them, not a blunder, not like we left the lens cap on or you know had our thumb in the frame. But instead, we mistook a signal for being cosmological when it was really produced in our own galaxy. And that's called dust. So dust is ubiquitous throughout the universe. And what happens when the star explodes, it shoots out dust and, and shrapnel into the cosmos, into the galaxy. And so somewhere in our galaxy, four or five billion years ago, a star exploded and it shot out basically what we think of as like meteorites, chunks of rock and, and, and metal, et cetera. And, um, and every now and then on, on my webpage, I, I email my followers uh, a chunk of meteorite, which is a chunk of space dust. So that you can go to at briankeating.com and join my mailing list. But that I actually send it out and you'll see it's like a chunk of mag magnetite. It's magnetic. It's incredibly dense. It's very heavy. And that came from an exploded star called a supernova. And that same material is what we detected. We actually didn't detect this violent explosion of the Big Bang. We detected the explosive aftermath of a supernova, which is still pretty cool. But on the other hand, it has no ramifications for the origin of the universe and had no ramifications 
on any of us winning the Nobel Prize, and hence my book is called Losing the Nobel Prize, because we came incredibly close to it if we had been confirmed, but we were never confirmed. So actually, the Webb telescope can't do what we did. We have now upgraded the BICEP instrument. It's now on a fourth generation uh, instrument. And then I'm leading a different project now with my colleagues at Princeton, Penn, and Berkeley called the Simons Observatory, which is even higher up. It's about 17,000 feet in the Atacama Desert and the Andes of northern Chile. And this telescope's going to be 30 to 100 times more powerful than the BICEP experiment was in my Losing the Nobel Prize book. So the current understanding is we don't know whether or not the universe began in this explosive origin of the universe. Case, Richard, that the universe has come into and out of existence uh, multiple times, maybe an infinite number of times throughout history. And we just don't know the answer yet. So it's exciting. We're still on the case. We don't know the answer. And that's what makes research so fascinating to do is that you, when you don't know the answer to something and you have to devise a clever way to get past the obstacles that you're facing, including things like uh, interloper cosmic signals that, that we you know, were hoping to find the first time and, now the game is still afoot, and so maybe somebody can still win the Nobel Prize. Although after my book's title and, and the kind of criticism I give towards the Nobel Prize, it's likely still not to be me. So how how were you able to overcome the angst and the anger at you know at not getting the Nobel Prize for this and getting pushed out from the experiment you created? Yeah, it was incredibly painful. It's kind of like, you know, somebody were to take away your kids or something. You know, you get very attached to the science that you do and you get a uh, kind of almost irrational sense of, of, um, you know, frustration and, and pain. Although, you know, it is my career and it's like, you know, getting pushed out of, of something that you created. For me, I, I resolved to work harder and to do better and to, you know, really work on working with colleagues that I felt shared this common mission and of, of wanting to get to the truth and not necessarily caring solely about winning these accolades and prizes as I did. I don't know about the others, you know, who, what, who knows what motivated them. <clears throat> and we're still friendly. You know, it's not like we, you know, are, are putting uh, pins and voodoo dolls with each other. I know they weren't super happy. I wrote the book, but uh, that may be because it was embarrassing for them too. And none of them won the Nobel prize either. So I think it's, um, it's encouraged me that the, you know, kind of the golden destination is rarely reached no matter what you do you know, becoming, you know, Cutco knife salesman of the year, or, you know, like there's only one person that does that, right? There's only one person that wins uh, or one team that wins the world series and they don't win it every year, year after year after year forever. Right. I think it's, it, it taught me a, a lesson of, of humility, but hopefully not humiliation because I think you've got to keep, got to stay in the game if you want to try to win it. And so Doing better and, you know, quote unquote, failure is an opportunity, as as I think Henry Ford once said, you know, to do better the next time. So you, you alluded to earlier on that you wrote a second book. What's that about? Let's talk about that for a bit. Yeah. So so I host a podcast in at UC San Diego called Into the Impossible. And this podcast is really to share the knowledge of visitors that come to my university and speak on behalf of what we have founded here called the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. And Arthur C. Clarke was a visionary science fiction writer and scientist and and, and kind of social gadfly. Uh, he's come up with many, many aphorisms and, and insights. And we wanted to honor his memory after he died. And so his foundation endowed us with the possibility of running the center to bring together artists and scientists and technicians and futurists and writers. And so we do a tremendous amount of work. I realized that I was meeting all these people, including nine Nobel Prize winners who came to UCSD or who, you know, visited me and came on um, my podcast. They would come here. And I was like, I get to have these great conversations, but nobody else hears them if we're just in the room. So I decided to start recording them and releasing them as podcasts in 2018. And this became the Into the Impossible podcast because one of Sir Arthur C. Clarke's sayings is the only way to discover the limits of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. And so our podcast called Into the Impossible and I record these. And then I realized I had nine Nobel Prize winners have done episodes with them. And we talk about science, but we also talk about life, the meaning of life, what love is, what legacy is, what they want their um, remembrance to be beyond the Nobel Prize. And I realized this is pretty amazing. But again, 
you know, it's like with your podcast, I like to listen to it and uh, it's great, but it's pretty hard to go back. Oh, let me go back to episode, you know, you've done what, 600 episodes or <laughs> just like enormous number of episodes. When I want to go back and like, it's pretty hard to, to know who was in it. And, uh, but I bet you have common themes that you could put together. Like, you know, with me now, you can have one on, you know, brilliant and handsome scientists, right? So you could, you could have a whole playlist of people like that, right? And so I realized, well, I got this playlist subset of the 150 episodes I've done that are just with Nobel Prize winners. Cool. So I said, let me turn that into a book. And it became a book of self-help guide using wisdom, uh, not their knowledge. Like there's almost no science in it. So it's called Into the Impossible, Think Like a Nobel Prize Winner. And it was actually written, uh, forward was written by James Altucher, who's a, f- a famous podcaster, as well as a good friend of mine. And Barry oh, Barrish. Yeah, Altucher, he's, he's a good guy. He's, yeah, he's a very good guy. Yeah. He's a good guy. Yeah. yeah, I've been on his show about 10 times. He's been on my show a couple of times. And, uh, but, but he kind of, he had a book called, um, Think Like a Billionaire, where he has like Mark Cuban and, and Sarah Blakely, I think, who started Span. You know, he has these nine or so billionaires. And he was like, well, you should do that. Uh, but he thought, oh, you should just do a book where you just take the transcripts from the podcast. But as you know, uh, it doesn't really lend itself to a very good reading experience. So I actually um, edited it heavily and went back and, and kind of added some thoughts and some and some some beautiful figures from a from a graphic artist. And we turned it into a book, kind of more inspired by like Tim Ferriss's books, like one's called Tribe of Mentors. That was really the the impetus for the book. I wanted to you know, not have to tell someone they have to go back to the podcast, although they could, they could, they don't have to buy the book. I actually made on my website, all the material in the book, including the illustrations is available for free, but, uh, but it's more like transcripts and it's harder to digest than the book. And we have an audio book, et cetera. So yeah, it's called into the impossible. Think like a Nobel prize winners lessons to stoke curiosity and overcome, especially which shocked me uh, that these guys who won the Nobel prize, Almost all of them, seven out of the nine of them, suffer from the imposter syndrome. I don't know if you know what that is, but it was shocking to me. So what the prize, yeah, what did it do mentally to the people that won it right when they won it? And then after, let's say, a year, did yeah. you look at that and what did you see? Yeah, it's interesting you ask that because, you know, if you look at like lottery winners or Super Bowl champions, there's a damn good chance that they're either broke or dead or their family hates them. You know, it's like sometimes victory can be a curse. And so I was fascinated by the question you just asked, you know, like, what are these people like? Like, what happens the day after, the month after, the year after? And some of them really suffered a lot after winning it because, again, there's more people on the space station right now flying over our heads than win the Nobel Prize each year. It's an incredibly rare accolade. And so especially in something where you're not remunerated by a financial means, you're remunerated by attention and prestige and honor uh, through the Nobel Prize as a physicist. And so this is like they got into the promised land, (laughs) you know, like not even Moses got into the promised land, right? So how do you figure out what to do next? And so a lot of them kind of, you know, are not comfortable with it. And they do suffer from what's called the imposter syndrome, which is this bias that you are not worthy of the accolades that you've been bestowed upon you. And, and so I tried to kind of counsel them as a, as almost like an armchair psychologist <laughs> that the greatest minds in human history. So the man who wrote the forward, Barry Barish, along with James Altucher, he won the Nobel prize in 2017. And he's kind of like, you know, this avuncular guy, great kind of uncle that everybody wishes they had, but he's very humble. And he's like, when I win, when, I, when you win a Nobel prize, you go to Stockholm you bow down in front of the king of Sweden and you're wearing this like super fancy tuxedo. It's not even a tuxedo. It's like a, a white tails and top hat. Anyway, you bend down and you have to kneel before the king. And then he puts this medal around your neck. And by the way, it's held on the day that Alfred Nobel, the guy who invented dynamite and was called the merchant of death for how many bombs and stuff he made during his lifetime. Anyway, it's held on the day he died, not the day he was born, which is December 10th every year. And at least during uh, non-COVID times. And so when Barry won the Nobel Prize in 2017, he went there and then they, they say, you know, to, to certify that you received your million dollar check and your gold medal and your plaque and everything else, sign this logbook here. So Barry's a curious guy and he wants to see, you know, who, who won it a couple of years ago? Oh, okay. This guy, you know, Frank Wilczek, who I also interviewed and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes back and he sees Albert Einstein and he sees the name and he froze and he got incredibly depressed. He said, who the hell am I compared to Einstein? And I told him in the interview that would later make its way into the book, I said, Albert Einstein had the imposter syndrome too. He just had it about someone who lived before him by the name of Isaac Newton. 
And he said, Isaac Newton did more for humanity than any other person before or since, meaning including Einstein. So Einstein had the imposter syndrome about Isaac Newton. And I said to Barry Barish, I said, guess what? Isaac Newton had the imposter syndrome too, because he felt he was completely inadequate and imposter before Jesus Christ. So I think it's interesting. No matter who you are, you'll always have this sense of being inadequate if you're humble, but you also need a little bit of swagger, confidence to achieve great things that no one um, has ever done before, to have the courage to go beyond the limits of the possible into the impossible, as they all did. So uh, it was a lot of fun to write the book. It was actually listed as a, a self-help book on Amazon, got about 90 reviews already in just two or three months. And for a while, Richard, I was very proud because, you know, it didn't win the Nobel Prize or anything like that, but oh. it was outranked. It was outranking Brene Brown, who's like my wife's favorite, you know, self-help author. That's cool. Well, do you, are you, um, I mean, strangely, are you happy that you didn't win the Nobel Prize? Like, have you come to that conclusion or like, how do you feel about it? You yeah. Know, you know, a time later. No one's ever asked me that question. That's a good question. Oh, good. Well, I wouldn't say I'm happy about it. Uh, I joke, you know, people say, oh, Brian, you just have sour grapes. Uh, you know, you would have gladly loved to, you know, win the Nobel Prize. And I say, well, you can see if I'm a hypocrite, you know, uh, by just getting them to offer me the Nobel Prize in literature or something for these books. And then if I accept it, then I'm a hypocrite. I, I wouldn't say that. It, it actually made me kind of mature. It made me realize that, um, you know, on your gravestone, yeah, they might put Nobel laureate or something like that, but it's not nearly as important as, you know, he was a good dad and he was a good husband and he was a good friend and he was a good scientist. And he taught many people around the world um, via his books and his YouTube and his podcast and, and, and his students that, you know, I've been blessed to have as a professor of physics for 17 years. And it's almost as if the stuff I do outside the lab and outside the observatory um, that has taken on much more significance to me. It used to be my definition of who I was, was so wrapped up in being a scientist that it was like the first thing. And then, you know, since that time when I created the experiment, I've been married and I've had kids, I've had great friends, I've had, you know, lost people that I loved and, and, and had people born that I love now. And it's, it put things in perspective again, that science means knowledge. Knowledge cannot, you know, is not a very valuable currency in the sense that, you know, it's not like time. Time, you can't ever get back. Money, you can get back. Knowledge, you can get back. You know, prestige, you can get back. But you can't get back your reputation once it's gone. And you can't get back your innocence once it's gone. And you can't recoup time with the people that mean the most to you. So really, more than anything, put things in perspective for me, I would say, Richard. Yeah, that's that's kind of funny and ironic. Maybe a double irony inside of uh, an irony, I don't know, that um, not getting the Nobel Prize made you feel the, the humanity of what you do and who you are and made you probably more of a, you know, a complete scientist, maybe even an, like a naturalist in a way. Yeah, it sort of uh, adapted the psychological aspect of it. You know, in the second book, Into the Impossible, I say, you know, I make this joke that that uh, people might be familiar with, but it's like, how do you know a scientist or an engineer or someone, a you know, mathematician is outgoing? Well, because he looks at your shoes when he talks to you and, uh, you know, instead of his own. And I felt like, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> there's no manual for how to be a scientist. There's no manual on how to be a professor. And yet the skills that I teach in this book by making parallels to these most accomplished scientists how do they collaborate with people? How do they listen to the critics such that their heart is not crushed? How do they get praise such that their head is not swollen? Those are the things I think you can teach, <laughs> um, unlike, you know, wisdom. So in other words, it's, I want to convert as much knowledge into wisdom as possible. And by virtue of these nine brilliant people, um, I have been able to hopefully do that. And I think it's made a big difference in demystifying, you know, what it means to be a scientist and what it means to, as I say in the book, I wasn't written for scientists. You don't have, there's not an equation in it. There's no homework. There's nothing. It's written for my avatar with some car salesman in, in Oklahoma that, you know, he could get uh, something out of it for collaboration, competition, uh, because the stakes are so high in science that, um, you know, hopefully they have something to learn from these people that have gone to the highest heights, literally, in their respective fields, and then translate that into a language everybody can understand. Well, here's last question or so. Um, what are some of the trends that you observed in the Nobel Prize winners that you interviewed that 
you know, were really interesting or disturbing to you or like really blew your mind? I think the the common trait was this this um admixture of humility and swagger that they had you know they felt like they don't really deserve where they're at you know to be compared to Einstein or whatever but on the other hand they did work their asses off they did you know kind of listen to critics at the right time they did collaborate they did use these methodologies that we never teach our students about communication persuasion there's a, a lot of salesmanship that goes on in science for funding for for credit for attention and i wanted to distill those hopefully for good you know, that students could use that or young professionals could use that um, to kind of hack the educational process and and level up where they're at uh, via these lessons from these laureates that otherwise would have been buried in some podcast RSS feed that no one's ever going to listen to. So I think that 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 you can be, you know, humble and confident and exist in that line of tension between those two disparate emotions. That is the key. If you can master that. And I, I have a quote, I think, from from this famous rabbinical uh, scholar um, who lived in 1700 or something. He said, every person should have two pockets and have notes inside of each pocket. In one pocket, he should have a note that the universe was created for him. The whole universe was created for me. That's what you should think. Then you should reach into the other pocket, and it should have another thing on it. I am nothing but dust and ashes. And so having those two kind of competitive um, uh, forces at work, if you can balance those two, I think you really have it made. Yeah, very interesting. Well, it's been very cool to speak to you, Brian. It's, uh, you know, but you're a lot more human than uh, some of the scientists I've spoken to. And I like that you bring the, hu- the human side of things into science. It's, uh, it's refreshing instead of just talking about, oh, we discovered this, this molecule or this mechanism, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, so I, where can, um, yeah, yeah, I really feel like scientists have an obligation, a moral obligation to p- give back to the taxpayers who pay our salary. I mean, most scientists, the dirty secret is we would do it for free. So the fact is you and your listeners, hopefully you're paying your taxes out there. If not, start now. There's no time like the present. And uh, you get you allow us to do it. So we have to pay you back by explaining it in ways you guys can understand. And that's what I endeavor to do. So, yeah, people can find me. I have a podcast. So just, you know. Uh, go over to uh, wherever you get in pod, listening to this podcast and look up Brian Keating, just my name. I have two podcasts. One is Into the Impossible. That's my main podcast. And then I spun out all the interviews in this book and more since, uh, since the book was written. I've already interviewed two more Nobel Prize winners. And uh, you can find another one called Into the Impossible. And then I have a YouTube channel that I'm pretty proud of called Dr. Brian Keating. And uh, I put out solo videos and, and explainers about cool topics in science, plus videos of the interviews I do on my audio podcast. So that's the best way to find me. I'm on Twitter at Dr. Brian Keating, and those are the best ways to find me. And it was great talking to you, Richard. Great questions and uh, some unique ones I hadn't heard before. Well, good. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.